Puerto Rico. I came down here looking for a story. It's called journalism. Your resume, huh? Don't look so anxious. I wouldn't have paid for your hotel if I hadn't already hired you. The Rum Diary takes place in 1959-1960. Um, Hunter had written The Rum Diary at that time. And then I got, you know, uh, got a few rejections from publishers and then stuffed it into a box. I happened to be rummaging through his boxes with him, uh, you know, uh, in 1997. Because he was a personal friend? Because he was a great, great friend of mine, yeah. yeah. And um, I located the, uh, the rum diary. But I found the strangest paradise on earth. Hey, you made it. But you said you had a TV. The guy across the alley has a TV. I have binoculars. Well, Hunter S. Thompson, there's, there's no way to explain the guy or define him. He was the quintessential journalist of the 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, he joined the Hells Angels to write about them, wrote a book in 1965, <clears throat> got beaten half to death. Um, so what he did, he, he developed a style which he called gonzo journalism, where he put himself in the center of the story uh, every time. The first time you met him... Quite a, quite a weird encounter by most people's standards. There was a rendezvous sort of set up. Uh, and I went to a place called the Woody Creek Tavern in uh, Woody Creek, Colorado. The front door exploded open of this bar. I was way in the back. And all I saw was sparks. I just saw sparks. And um, then I saw the, a sea of people kind of spread, you know, just, it just opened up. And um, it was Hunter. He had a three-foot cattle prod in his left hand. And he had a, a taser gun in his right hand. And uh, he, was, <laughs> he was clearing the decks, as it were. And he, you know, he made his way back to me, introduced himself. We sat down, had a drink, got along famously, realized that we were both uh, uh, Kentucky boys. And um, within about 10 minutes of that, he invited me back to his house to uh, build a bomb and shoot it with a shotgun. Want to just, just that last bit, do you want to just take us through that? So build, you actually, you built a bomb. Yeah, we went back to his and house and in his kitchen we built a bomb of nitroglycerin and propane and, uh, and uh, shot it with a nickel-plated 12-gauge shotgun. Okay. That's how we met. <laughs> <laughs> That's day one. Yeah. Now, you see, the thing is, I'm not sure who that tells us more about, him or you. <laughs> what does it tell us about you, that kind of, because you, you're clearly drawn to characters like that, because I know you, you uh, became friends with Brando. Mm -hmm. And what, what is the, what's going on there? You're drawn to these people who are kind of, who live on the edge. I, I suppose I'm drawn to um, individuals, real individuals, who are, I mean, individual, and I mean that in, that word is, is dying these days, you know. I mean, a proper individual, someone who is exactly who they are themselves and not of the lemming variety, you know, or dressing like the other guy or trying to behave like the other guy. So do, does Johnny Depp have a pretty acute radar for sniffing out the people who are just oh, full yeah. of most, whatever? Mo most definitely, yeah. For 20 years I made a string of what were considered in Hollywood failures. Just failures. And what was happening was you'd see, you'd, you'd, get, you'd start getting phone calls. When a film was about to be released you'd get these phone calls you know, uh, from heads of studios or for, from, from, you know, these upper echelon sort of guys at companies saying, gee, I haven't seen you in a long time. God, we should get together. Let's have lunch, you know what I mean? Just on the off chance that that film that's coming out might be the one. Is that it? I think so. You and I are very similar ages. And one thing that occurs to me straight away is that I could never get away with what you're wearing. <laughs> well, I don't either, you know. <laughs> uh, my kids would just roar with laughter if I, if I came out in the morning wearing stuff like that. They would just roar. <laughs> but you get away with it. I mean, it's, that's cool. At least my kids don't roar, but they do. My, you know, my daughter does paint my nails now and again, and you've got to deal with it. Can we see? I mean, uh, am I allowed to say she hasn't done a terrific job, or is that your fault? No, you that's, that's my fault because they've all chipped and stuff like that. I haven't properly taken care of them, but yeah, that's, oh, okay. that's, that's the work of my daughter. Can I just ask about the tattoos and, and the other bits and bobs there? I mean, the, the, you've got quite a bit on your arms there. I have some tattoos, yeah. Can we have a look? Can I ask? Sure. What have you got there? That's a rook. Is there a reason for a rook? A uh, rook was uh, a, a, a card game. Uh, an old school card game that my grandfather played all the time, and I remember him playing that very well, so that was for him, and that's him there. 
That's actually a picture of you, a grand, in a kind of a, is that like a, was he a sailor? He was in the Navy, yeah. Have you stopped with the tattoos now? You, maybe a few more? No, you know, I mean, you know, you run out of room, certainly, but, uh, you know, I've always looked at, looked at them like, you know, a, a kind of a, a journal, you know, a, a part of your life, you know, that you, you uh, um, mark yourself uh, at a certain point, you know, and everything kind of means something, so it's like a body journal. Can I talk to you about jokes? Certainly. You hate jokes, right? I do. I, I, had to live, I had to live with Al Pacino, you know, for six months doing Donnie Brasco, who, who, tell, who told me this joke over and over and over and over and over. I mean, and I heard this joke 50 times, and I still never liked it. But he kept telling me, and that became the joke. Because he was just trying to wind you up. He'd go, he'd go like this, John, John, skeleton goes into a bar. Orders a beer and a mop. You have the same exact reaction I did. I'm not kidding. I don't know. I, don't... I know. Skeleton goes into a bar, orders a beer and a mop. <laughs> I really don't know. I'm not making it up. I know. I haven't got a clue. It takes a little while. I know. I'm going to have to come back to that one. <laughs> So that's why, that's why I hate jokes. <laughs> yeah, you've got me. Good morning, sir. How are we today, sir? Fine. I'm fine, thank you. Radiant. Radiant, as you English people like to say. The Fast Show, when I finally was introduced to The Fast Show, for me it was a revelation. I mean, it was... Uh, I'd never seen anything that great. I'd never seen anyone that quick or clever or that funny. And that deadpan. So dry. So funny. Um... And Gervais, I mean, you know, Ricky certainly got that. You know, Ricky's, Ricky's a very talented, uh, he's a very talented boy, you know. We're done for time. That's us finished. Are you going to tell me the, the joke? Are you going to tell me or just leave it there? The skeleton goes into the bar. It's a horrible joke. And, and, and he inflicted it upon me, and now I've done it to you, and I feel terrible. A skeleton, skeleton, goes into a bar, orders a beer, skeleton, and a mop. See? Thank you. Ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> That's Al Pacino. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.